you're going to find yourself on an FBI watch list this year. Like I would just, I don't know that we end with the registered church and the oppressions of religion that we see with the Soviet Union, but I also see that that's not off the table whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's really concerning and it just seems unnecessary to proclaim a term that the left has set up as yeah. as a I'm worried about that label. Too. Yeah. I'm worried about that too. I, but the only reason I hang on to it and the only reason I would say in some way you can classify me as that is because I'm not going to let them usurp language and just do whatever they want to with it. Now, maybe that's naive and uh, the, the jury's already out as far as that's concerned. But, um, but I want to fight the lie that white supremacy is the greatest threat fa- facing our I'm nation sure. right now. Uh, and, and I want to fight the lie that Christian nationalism is worse than Al Qaeda. Welcome to Indie Thinker with Reed Huberman. You're about to make the jump from the dishonest mainstream media into free and independent thought from key thought leaders on the subjects of culture, causes, politics, and faith. Welcome to the Indie Thinker guest show. I am very excited about the guest that we have on today. James Lindsay broke into the mainstream, I'd say, with the hoax papers and by them revealed that one, he has a great sense of humor, two, that he also is conversant in the language of the the academy, so a very bright man. And then third of all, also, that perhaps the academy has been captured by the ideological left more so than what we had first assumed. And after that, he has done a fantastic job of kind of exposing cultural Marxism, DEI, CRT, and how it has impacted our institutions, and he has become one of the most prominent intellectuals of our time. And as a result of that, I wanted to bring him back on the show for a conversation about multiple things, but ultimately, we're going to be talking about Christian nationalism today. So, James, thanks so much for being on. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so over uh, Christmas break and a little bit before that, I started noticing some uh, messages about Christian nationalism pop up on your social media feed that I thought were absolutely hilarious. We're going to dig into those a little bit uh, in just a moment. But I'd also like to talk about uh, just initially a documentary that you were just recently on. And then we'll also talk a little bit about Claudine Gay, that kind of controversy, DEI, because I think it will sow into the more broad conversation of Christian nationalism. But ultimately, the, the question question that, that I have, and perhaps maybe others do, if they have an open mind and they're willing to critically think on the subjects that are being force-fed to us by the mainstream, is, uh, is this. Is Christian nationalism a conspiracy theory on the left? We don't talk very often about leftist conspiracy theories because it seems as though only the right has them these days. Um, is it a conspiracy theory? Uh, akin to maybe like QAnon on the right, or is it something that is a genuine concern? So we'll try to hash that out. Um, I, as a Christian, obviously believe the first one, and uh, we'll see what you think uh, throughout. But I have a feeling that that I know perhaps what, you, what you'll say. But let's first just discuss uh, Beneath Sheep's Clothing. So I just caught this on your social media feed the other day, a documentary that you're on uh, or in. And uh, tell us a little bit about that film. Well, it turns out... Um <clears throat> Pardon me. It's it's really exciting. Um, so it is a new film, and what we've done in the last week or so, is, it should be coming out probably in March officially for everybody. But we we did some uh, early screenings in uh, Phoenix and in St. George, Utah, and then in just south of Salt Lake City in Lehigh, Utah. And they were actually, uh, especially the Utah events, were really well attended, really well received. But it gave us a chance to see the thing on the big screen, to see how our audiences react to things and, and um, you know, retool it for that final push so we can do a March release. Uh, it looks like we'll have probably a showing sometime in February uh, in Miami as well to kind of, you know, catch the same same wave a little bit. And it's built up a lot of excitement around the film. The film, the idea, comes from the author Julie Beeling, who wrote a book by the same title, Beneath Sheep's Clothing, Actually, as a result of her master's work, she's a Mormon, or more or less, and she did her mission in the Soviet Union just after it collapsed. So technically, wow. uh, Russia uh, in in the early 90s. 
and then she came back to the U.S. after she spent two years over there meeting with, you know, technically former Soviets, asking them lots of questions, of course, about God, seeing as she was there on a religious mission, and um, finding that what she was hearing from the Russians didn't match what she expected. She expected to run into tons of atheists. What she actually found was tons of people who secretly believed in God and had, had done so all along and just kind of kept it quiet and made it personal and all of this. And so she came back and got a master's, a double master's in Russian literature and something else to do with Russian history. I think it might be Russian history. And she had this idea for her that, that the way that we understand religion and religious persecution, especially of fringe minority religions uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses and so on in Russia or Soviet Union, is not what people expect. So she wrote her master's thesis on that for a decade. This gnawed at her that she should write it out as a book. She kind of drafted it out. That became Beneath Sheep's Clothing. After, ironically enough, seeing some of my work and coming to a talk I gave out in Salt Lake City, she um, did a big push to finish the book, and she gave me an early copy that she literally printed off at Kinko's with spiral binding, <laughs> eight by yeah. eight and a half by 11 paper. And I, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll read this, um, you know, and which is to say I didn't read that. And uh, she then contacted me some months later and said, you know, I think we're going to make a documentary. Will you be in it? And I thought, well, I better read it. And I read it, and it's, the book is shockingly good. I really didn't expect much. People hand me stuff at events all the time, and it turns I'm out sure. to be really good, um, really well-researched, really thorough, really clear, very well-argued and articulated and it's kind of horrifying the way that uh, the, the Soviets did. So it's almost worth telling briefly what they did to the churches because people don't understand. Mm -hmm. What they did actually was they set up what they would call, and this will actually, I think, apply to our conversation about Christian nationalism. Um, they set up a church called the Registered Church or Registered Churches. They were registered with the, with the state. Basically, the KGB ran them. Um, and then there were independent churches outside of the registered church, and they would infiltrate all of the uh, independent churches with KGB agents who would then do what we would consider in our language today false flags. Mm. Uh, they'd try to get the congregation to split. They'd try to get the congregation to rise up and do something stupid, so then the KGB and the Cheka would come and, and crush them. Um, and it's remarkable uh, you know, to see that the goal wasn't to actually completely get rid of the church and Soviet Union, even though it was supposed to be this godless atheist program. The goal was to bring in um, a completely registered church that looked like Christianity but actually preached Soviet state worship. Mm. And, uh, you know, whoever the leader was, Stalin and Khrushchev and so on. And she branched out from the churches and also talked about the way that it impacts in the schools. But the story of how it became a documentary is kind of crazy. She finally finished her book. She put it up on Amazon, self-published it so people could have it, whatever. She thought, okay, this was the calling that I had. I answered my calling and like finally I'm going to be able to get to sleep. She couldn't sleep. She just had these pictures in her head of the book as a film. And at four in the morning, she finally decided to have a rather glib prayer. <laughs> she, she said she prayed to God, God, listen, if you want to film, you do it. I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sleep. You know, okay, thanks, bye, in Jesus' name or something. <laughs> That's it. And she actually was able to go to sleep after a little prayer. And a few weeks later, something like five copies of the book had sold. She had mentioned it on her Facebook, which somehow ended up in this Utah forum on Facebook, which ended up in the hands of this guy named Steve Sorensen, who lived about two hours from her and is a filmmaker. And hmm. he saw the book and he checked it out and he contacted her on Facebook and said, we need to turn this into a film and I'm going to do it all pro bono. It's like, I just want this to be a film out there. Yeah. It needs to be a film. And so all of a sudden it's like literally like, that prayer got answered. So what's she going to do? Like walk away from that. You can't do that. So they made, started making the documentary last summer. They gathered a bunch of interviews, people like me, Alex Newman. A lot of people know who he is. Um, Trevor Loudon, uh, and then seek Smith, you know, who, whose parents, she was actually born in Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge and, um, some some Soviets that she was able to get in contact with, ex-Soviets who, you know, ran dissident churches and were persecuted by the KGB, put together an amazing product. Yeah. There is nothing 
out there having seen I guess we shouldn't necessarily call it the rough draft, but the early draft, there's nothing out there that communicates the kind of totality and scope of the problem that we face right now, and in particular dipping into the aspects relevant to the church. There's nothing out there that communicates it this broadly and this digestibly at the same time in comparison to this thing. And it turns out Steve Sorensen isn't just like some dude in Utah who makes films in his basement. It turns out he's really good. It, he yeah, made an yeah it's a great film. product. So I'm really excited about it anyway. Um, I think it's going to make a huge dent in um, getting people to understand the problem. Of, the, the dent will go in the problem, which is that people don't fully understand what's happening around us right now. Mm. And to see the parallels to outright communism um, makes it just that much clearer. Yeah, it's really it really is unsettling, right, to look around and to see things going on and, and to come away scratching your head and say, like, I, I don't know why this is this is happening. It's been we talked a little bit about this the first time you came on, but it is a really like unsettling feeling to constantly feel like the ground beneath you is shaking and the things that you assumed were are, are not as they are. And then to hear these things like, for instance, I, I just. Uh, was listening to the repository of all intellect. I was listening to a clip from The View, and on it, Kamala Harris would have you believe that um, women are just dying in the street because of abortion laws in Texas, and women have sepsis, and babies are being birthed into toilets, and um, just the kind of things that you hear that if you're like a good person and you see the vice president, you would think to yourself, well, you know, person in a position of power, person that should be uh, in a respectable position, saying these things, you don't really hear them on the news, uh, but saying these things, and you want to believe that our political leaders uh, are telling us the truth to a certain degree because we want to believe that the people running our country actually are honest people, right? Because the the implications of the opposite of that, you know, are quite troublesome. Uh, but we find more and more and more that we just cannot trust what we're hearing and what's being spoon fed to us all the time. And maybe that will kind of sew into, uh, well, let, before I do that, let me, let me just ask this. So uh, what's the release of the film and where can you watch it? Yeah. So um, just on what you were saying, the, the most unsettling part for me really is this um, moment where you start to realize there's no way this is just a series of accidents. Like, it seems like they're breaking things on purpose, which yeah. it's very hard for good normal people to think maybe there's intention behind failure. Like everybody, you think, uh, you know, I go to your, my job, I do the best job I can. You think you're going to, everybody goes to work and does the best job they can. And it just doesn't enter into your consciousness very quickly that maybe what they're doing is actually creating problems rather than solving yeah. them. Um, but uh, yeah, you see parallels. I mean, I think that's actually kind of fitting, but uh, for for paralleling again to Beneath Sheep's Clothing, people will get a, an eyeful. Um, so everything uh, about the movie is at a very easy to remember website, which is Beneath Sheep's Clothing, all is one word, Beneath Sheep's Clothing dot movie. And so you can keep up with the premieres, uh, the showings, anything that gets announced. We're not sure how many in-person showings we'll do. We know we're going to do one in Miami uh, in February after that. They're expensive. They're complicated. Julie yeah. has a kid. It's like it's there. It's a lot of work to put them on, but it will be available actually uh, streaming probably through that same website. But all the announcements and updates will be there, which is, again, beneath sheep's clothing dot movie. Um, or follow me on social media because I'll be talking about it a lot. Okay, great. Yeah, that's where I first saw it and then went to the website. Uh, and then I'll also provide a link down below so, so that people can access that. But kind of circling back to the whole idea of not being able to trust um, kind of uh, people in elite positions of power and what we're hearing. Um, the view thing that I mentioned before is just an absolute total lie. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was listening to Glenn Lowry and John McCorder uh, just before our conversation, and uh, they they were bold enough to actually uh, just state what we should all know by now, but still many people don't, which is that uh, George Floyd was not married, murdered by uh, Derek Chauvin. Um, and so I, it was really interesting to hear their conversation about this, um, and there's perhaps a unfortunately a price to pay when black intellectuals go against the narrative that has been told to them in in black communities and um 
But, but I think it is incumbent upon us as good people, people of conscience, to reject a narrative if it is a lie. Um, so uh, one of the things that I am concerned about, I'd love to hear what you think about this generally speaking, but I feel like um, I think it's obvious enough to be objectively true that I don't think the greatest threat to our freedom in the present is from foreign government. I don't even think it's from domestic government forces. I actually think it's from the private sector. I think it's from people who hold institutional power and most importantly, disseminate information. So I, I have a question about that, but what do, you, what do you think about that general statement? Well, um, and I don't know if this will end up answering your question. Uh, the answer that is that I'd give you is I agree, but it's more complicated than that because I don't see that the walls of separation between public sector and private sector mm. are are really in existence any longer. I don't really believe at the level of large publicly traded companies. Now, I'm not talking about mom and pop hardware store or whatever, if those things even still exist. Right. I'm talking about large publicly traded corporations. Um, they are in the public-private partnership model, which, in my opinion, means there's no such thing as a public sector versus a private sector. There is a, pub a single public-private sector that mm -hmm. have merged, and they've merged through various mechanisms, whether it's SEC reporting requirements on you know environment and government and, and social impact and all of this stuff, whether it's through the investment uh, lending and the uh, passive investment kind of – I don't know a better word than scam that, that Larry Fink is running at BlackRock and the other large investment uh, platforms, your huge uh, pension management funds, really. Yeah. Uh, they're demanding ESG compliance or else you're not going to have access to their listings. You're also not going to have access to short-term capital. There's a large amount of corporate collusion, and that corporate collusion is running revolving doors in and out of positions of government regulation through administrative apparatuses primarily. And so I don't see that there's really a big distinction, but I think that your instinct is completely right that the real power being pressed upon us is primarily being done by non-governmental actors. Mm -hmm. And those non-governmental actors are corporations and uh, nonprofits or, or non-governmental organizations, NGOs. I think that that is correct. I'll further complicate the story a little bit by adding in the influence of the CCP because the CCP controls China, and therefore the CCP controls the largest consumer market on the planet right now under the current structure that we're, we have in, in global business, which means that Nike could give a fig what American buyers want and don't want from Nike because they have 1.2 billion Chinese buyers and they have 200 million American buyers as kind of upper limits. Yeah. And it's just a, you know, that's a factor of six to one. They just, the market is so much bigger. And so there is this ability for, for China to lead our corporate environment around, even without aspects that we know are happening of infiltration and backdoor deals and corruption, just by the gravity of the size of their their uh, their market share. And so corporations are highly attracted to the gigantic, growing, booming Chinese market, which is evolving now. For the last decade and a half, the Chinese market has been, or maybe a little earlier than that, you know, go back five years, then the decade and a half. Um, the Chinese market finally had money. The average Chinese citizen started to actually finally have money. And so I was in China a few times and kind of watched this evolve and explode and calm down. And um, the the nouveau riche, uh, even though they weren't rich, the nouveau riche vibe in China was insane. Brand name everything. People were like wearing the. It, it looked like Flava Flav from the '90s with the giant <laughs> clock, except it was like the biggest possible like chanel logo you could wear but you'd mm -hmm. have a hat that was one brand sunglasses that were different a shirt that was a different thing on your neck that was different pants yeah. that were different shoes that were different like every major brand you could show so there was this you know huge flood into consumer products with brand name identification and that's calmed down in the chinese market in the past maybe 10 years because they kind of got over their sugar rush so to speak um in the average populace but that was a huge you know, market distortion for a while. So the influence of, when I say that this Chinese market matters, the Chinese market is completely subject to the CCP and mm -hmm. its wants. And access to the Chinese market is completely dictated 
through the basically what's being called the Great Firewall. If you want to do business in China, you do business in China on China's terms, or they kick you out with their right. with their totalitarian government. And so, if Nike wants to even have access to that market, they have to bend to the Chinese government's wants in all kinds of ways as a precondition of even accessing the market. So the Chinese, the CCP, I should say specifically, can very easily control our corporations without actually having a hand in the boardroom or a hand on it and no corruption. And we know that those other things are happening. We know that mm -hmm. they're also colluding with entities like BlackRock and the World Economic Forum, maybe the White House, but uh, the United Nations to create those same conditions that are, are pressuring our corporate and nonprofit sector to go along with all of these things that we're doing that seem like they're very bad for the West and very good for China at the same time for some peculiar reason. So it's a little more in depth than than this kind of either or. Yeah. But yeah, the 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 boot is coming from the corporate sector. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's interesting. So I was uh listening to some of the World Economic Forum just because I wanted to blow my brains out and I saw this um I don't know if you you've seen this yet circ circulate online, but I saw this round table of people at the WEF and they were talking about the media and how people don't trust the media. Um now these were just wealthy people um that were corporatists and that kind of thing. These weren't people that were journalists, they weren't reporters, they weren't on TV and they didn't own news organizations, but they kept on using the word we. They kept and they weren't non-binary either. Uh so they kept on saying we uh they don't they don't trust us and we have to tell people now where we're sourcing our stories and our, where our information is coming from. And, I'm, and I thought it was very like, um, I, I don't know, I guess 1984-ish is the best way to, to talk about it because they were lumping themselves together in with, a, with the media narrative just because they simply come from an ideological perspective. So they were essentially giving away the bag there that uh, that they have been in control of the media narrative for a very long time, and they're starting to slowly but surely lose that control. But, but I guess it, kind of bringing it back to uh, maybe closer to the subject of what we want to want to discuss, um, I, I think we're seeing a lot where the narrative is being controlled, or let's just call it manipulated, in such a way that. Um, that hopefully people are waking up to, but but also in a way that is just so like mind numbing. So, for instance, Claudine Gay um, and what took place at Harvard. For those who don't know, Claudine Gay is the president of Harvard. She did something like uh, plagiarized over 40 times in a paper, m made some really stupid, foolish remarks about Israel when she she was asked and then was um, fired from her job. And immediately uh, she said she was fired from her job because of the color of her skin. And we don't we shouldn't forget the intersectional uh, because she is also a woman. Um, and and it had nothing to do with the fact that she uh, plagiarized over 40 times. It was that she was was a black woman. The reason I bring this up is that you have been so good at talking about the ways in which um, our institutions have been captured by ideological means. Um, and so uh, Claudine Gay is a perfect example of how DEI is being used and foisted upon the American public to um, uh, to to mislead us as to what's really going on. And then that media and then that narrative was also picked up by the media. Of course, it's an attack on black people because conservatives don't like black people, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's just ridiculous. And if you're not paying attention, I, I can understand perhaps why people might even fall for that kind of nonsense. Um, but it, it, it's a reminder to me of a couple of things. One, that they are constantly, and when I say they, I mean people on the, the left, um, and people in, in positions of power that disseminate information, especially in places like the academy. They are constantly doing uh, something that I think we need to be aware of. They are blaming people for the things that they are responsible for. They are constantly pointing the finger for the things that they do. I mean, Antifa is a great example of this. The guy wearing the black face mask and the crowbar in his hand trying to beat up anybody who says something they don't like are anti or quote anti-fascist. So, um, uh, so they're constantly doing that. But then also, uh, you said something online about the DEI cartel, and you said that they have cartel-like instincts and cartel-like tactics. So I guess I'm interested in broadly kind of the tactic of 
the people who are like the most racist are the ones who call themselves anti-racist. Um, that kind of whole, we're going to blame you for the thing that we are actually doing. Um, because I know you've studied this, at, at least in terms of Marxism, but, but I'm also uh, more specifically interested in what, what do you mean by like cartel tactics? Well, I mean, there are two things happening with that. And one of those is that the, what, what I refer to as the iron law of woke projection, mm. which is that they always project. Um, they project significantly in two or three ways, depends on how you want to cut these things. One is that they do exactly what you just said. They blame other people for doing what they're doing. That has a name in the psychological literature, which is DARVO, which stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse the Roles of Victim and Offender, um, which is a classic signature of narcissistic abuse. And so, you know, we didn't plagiarize. Uh, that's deny, or that's not the problem. Plagiarism's not the problem. Deny, deny, deny. You're the problem because you just want black women not to be able to succeed in media. There's attack. And now all of a sudden they've reversed the roles of victim and offender. Uh, she's the offender, but now she's the victim. You were uh, made into the offender through the Darvo. And this is a classic signature of, of woke projection, but also of narcissistic abuse. And D-A-R-V-O, it's an acronym. And people can go look up. There's tons of literature about Darvo and dealing with Darvo. This is not like a new concept that just propped up in the last couple of years. They also project in that they tell you what they're going to do ahead of time. And they also project through what's called uh, sometimes confession through projection. Mm -hmm. um, so they say, you know, uh, the conservatives just want to ban books, right, in the schools. What about Dr. Seuss? What about To Kill a Mockingbird? Yeah. What about decolonizing the curriculum? They've been doing it forever. So they're just confessing. They're banning books, but we're going to put it on the other guy. Um, and you can come up with a bajillion examples of this. You know, education is always based in social emotional learning. We're just trying to organize it correctly. Well, they think that some kind of brainwashing program is what education always is, but it's not. But they're just confessing that that's how they think about education. So there's this I call the iron law of woke projection. Um, it's iron. It's an iron law. So it's almost always true. I've yet to find an example where it's not true. And there are times when I read Marxist literature that I just don't really understand what I'm reading until I pass it through the filter of maybe this is projection. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it all makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most useful heuristics that I've, I've got for understanding yeah. their behavior. Um, with Claudine Gay specifically, it's really um, entertaining because they tried so hard to make the narrative be that we don't want black women to succeed as scholars when, as a matter of fact, the reply that I saw and I gave many times was very simple. It's like, why don't you just not plagiarize if you want to be <laughs> yeah. president of Harvard? You know, this isn't a high bar here. And yeah. um, so it was really cartoonish that they tried to apply this. It kind of in defense of DEI, and I think it largely backfired. But um, just for the point of record, though, just because this whole narrative barrage became about not wanting black women to succeed in academia. And we say that Claudine Day Gay got fired. That's not actually quite correct. She was asked to step yeah. down from the position of president. She is still a full tenured professor at Harvard yeah. in the political science department. And she's still receiving her full presidential salary of $900,000 a year plus benefits. Y yes, I so want to be an impressed black woman. Yeah, she is cleaning up to a, the tune after you add in benefits of a million dollars a year which is a fairly substantial amount of money and still a full professor, still has access to do whatever illegitimate activity that's based off of her illegitimate research that she does in the classroom and wherever else. She just had to step down from the position of authority, um, but kept everything. Uh, it, it, and it's just mind boggling that that also got washed out completely in the, you don't want black women. This black woman is succeeding She's failed upwards, as a matter of fact. She shouldn't even be succeeding. She hasn't earned it. She literally stole it. And she's succeeding at a level that is, is mind-boggling. Um, so, again, just washed out of the narrative. So this actually could be kind of a cartel tactic. But in general, the cartel tactics work in a very simple way. Um, Jimmy the Gun shows up and tells you, you got a nice little Italian restaurant here. Be shame if anything happened to it, right? So if you don't tow the line, you're going to get accused of hating black women or not, not uh, you know, 
fighting against white supremacy well enough or being a racist or having done a racism or they'll dig something up on you like they tried to go after bill ackman's wife for yeah. you know it turns out plagiarism's on a scale it turns out there's actually a website you can go to it's called plagiarism today i can't believe it exists but it exists and they actually have a 10 point scale of of seriousness that's like pretty well established and well recognized i checked with a couple academics they're like oh yeah that's real and like bill ackman's um plagiarism wouldn't even like or his wife i should say wouldn't even merit up to you know like a three out of ten and like they consider anything below a seven is basically like eh, apologize correct shrug your shoulders claudine gay is like 10 like she's all the way on it's yeah. all the way up there it's a complete it's it's like it's not all instances are the same like leaving a quotation yeah. mark and out for, of a paraphrase. for reference to just so people know for reference the person that she actually plagiarized spoke out against this uh, a while before any of this came in to the into the open and reports started being done um uh, about it and she said yeah this woman's stealing my work yeah exactly and so this is um this is a kind of cartel tactic it's like you go along with us or we're going to bust your kneecaps um sort of a uh, activity and they have the institutional power to be able to do it in many cases they had much more of that a few years ago um we've kind of broken free of their their grip and their their spell but i mean you know, we still have once in a while a guy that ends up going on TV that gets accused of doing a racism and he's crying and the whole struggles have some things happening to him and it's still like yeah. hitting him. So they still have some of this power. Um, but you can expect there's going to be a full blast media and social media campaign against you, um, which is it's Jimmy the gun showing up to your digital footprint and deciding they're going to bust up all your windows and, and maybe you're going to behave better next time. That's cartel stuff. Yep. Um, that's mob tactics. Uh, more importantly, DEI though, is just, it's, it's straight up. It's the Soviet. It's, it's literally the Soviet. The E is equity. Equity means socialism. People want to disagree, but here's the definition of one or the other of the words. You tell me which one an administered system in which shares are adjusted so citizens are made equal. Hmm. Turns out that's the definition of both of those words, socialism and equity. And so they're the same concept. They yeah. just apply slightly differently. It's not purely economic. Now there's other factors taken in. It's, other, it's the same. Diversity means hiring people that are diverse to the prevailing American cultural system, which is shorthand for communists. Yeah. And inclusion means making them feel welcome and making sure that you purge anything and censor anything that those now commissars don't like. So it's literally the Soviet system. And the Soviet system is also a mob racket run by the party. Um, where it's, you know, it's a shame about your little kulak stand you have here. It'd be, <laughs> if anything happened to it, whoops, you grew too, in Beneath Sheep's Clothing, there's a story from a, a Soviet uh, survivor where she's talking about her grandparents and the, the KGB showed up and chased them out of their house with their four little kids into the street merely because their house was, you know, a, a couple dozen square feet bigger than the other houses in the village. Yeah. So that wasn't equal. So they got deposed and thrown out into the street. I've heard stories from Chinese survivors, Shi Van Fleet and, and Lily Tong Williams, among others, uh, particularly talking about in China where, you know, somebody, some woman sometimes, like a widow, would own like three and a half acres of land for a little allotment peasant farm. And whoops, that's too much. So they'd come and split it into 10 pieces and do share. Cry and then she's just out. Like she's a landlord now and they're bullied and, and beaten in the land reform programs. And so it's the same mafia kind of tactics were happening there. Um, if you weren't towing the line of their definition of equity or whatever and supporting the narrative of the state, then the KGB would show up and, and bust things up. Uh, another guy in the film, in Beneath the Sheep's Clothing, Timothy, Timothy is his name, is talking about how they were so against the idea of God that the KGB would show up to people they knew were Christians outside of the registered churches, and they would show up in the middle of the night, and they'd just start breaking your furniture and breaking, you know, tear up the beds, break yeah. your dishes. And what they claimed that they were looking for, they don't need to break your dishes for this, was anything written about God whatsoever, which they would then confiscate, and then you'd be punished if you had any, um, because they didn't want people disseminating the gospel or sharing hymnals or whatever, uh, which is um, what they were doing, you know, underground at night it was creating and, and figuring out ways to hide and share those materials with other Christians. Um, so that's mob tactics. And we see the same exact behavior out of the DEI. They're hit. I mean, they're not showing up with the police like, well, 
like the secret police or whatever and busting your dishes. But they go after you on social media. They'll write a flurry if you're a big enough deal of articles about you. If you're a small nobody, all of a sudden you might find yourself in the you know, New York Times story having your life ruined where they've dug something up. It's the same exact model implemented through, you know, a different means. Yeah. So that's interesting because that does kind of bring us full circle to Christian nationalism, because I think that if if anybody should be aware of this kind of tactic, it should be Christians, because this is actually this iron law of woke projection has been happening to Christians for a while now. So um, you're, you're perfectly fine to be an employed professor at Iowa State University um, in the science department unless you posit intelligent design. And then we're going to try to do our best to make sure that we get rid of you, fire you, smear you, and make sure that you don't get tenure. And this is exactly what happened to Guillermo Gonzalez. Um, and I, I, could, I could run off a list of people who are Christians in the academy specifically, but also uh, just in life, who voiced um, Christian opinions found in scripture and then were essentially canceled as a result for, for the crime of of believing in Christian things. And we see this a lot presently, especially in the LGBTQ cartel, because if a Christian happens to say, you know, maybe it's best that we don't, you know, shove fat men in women's clothing and then have them twerk in front of the kids for library day. Well, then, of course, you're not a loving Christian. You're not benevolent. How could you be so evil as to uh, reject somebody's, you know, you know, personhood, right, as though their personhood is related to dressing up as a woman? And so these kind of Freudian tactics have been used for a long time on the Christian church, and I would hope that we would be used to it. And I, I can't help but believe that this is also what is happening when it comes to Christian nationalism. Just recently, I think um, I, I've, been, I've been curious about this for a while, but just to use a recent example. Um, so you, you hear these kind of new evangelical deconstruction, progressive Christian types uh, decrying Christian nationalism. You hear people on the left like Rob Reiner making a documentary called God and Country about Christian nationalism. You hear James Carville on the Bill Maher show saying that their Christian nationalists are worse than Al Qaeda. Um, it sounds a lot like white supremacy and what Biden says about it. But, but then you hear crickets when Biden goes to Emmanuel AME Church in South Carolina uh, just a couple of weeks ago and then gets up there on stage uh, in order to basically, at a church, hold a uh, campaign rally for his 2024 election and nothing about Christian nationalism whatsoever. And so, again, you've got this kind of twisted newspeak of Christian nationalism being this great threat, but then when Biden mixes religion and politics, is absolutely fine. So over... Um, um, uh, the Christmas break, I was paying attention to your social media feed, and you probably did it a little bit before this, but you were uh, posting some hilarious things about Christian nationalism, and you were saying something uh, jokingly, I have the flu, or something like that, and then you would say, oh, and by the way, Christian nationalism is 10,000% an op. So I want to mm -hmm. talk about Christian nationalism more broadly now, um, and I, I want to dig into why this is being used, I believe, as a tactic, as you described, um, as uh, in, in the form of the iron law of woke projection, um, as a manipulative tactic for political power. Um, so first and foremost, for those who um, are not hip to uh, modern day lingo, you said Christian nationalism is 10,000% an op. So what is an op? Okay, so just in case anybody's lost, op is spelled O-P, and it yeah. is short for operation, as in it is a strategic operation by, in effect, the equivalent of the secret police or whatever to try to ensnare Christians in this case uh, and to paint them, whether it's just media-based, that it's going to be scary stories to scare the middle away from voting for Republicans for the first time, or whether it's something that looks very much like January 6th. January 6th was an op. Um, there was, in fact, I think that, I don't know if Charlie Kirk is the one who started it or not, but he was calling it Entrapment Day, and I think that that's kind of the perfect way to put it. And the documentation that the federal government holds about Christian nationalism, which is the basis, and I think even just watching the trailer that I can demonstrate that this documentation is the basis for the Rob Reiner film, God and Country, which, by the way, is another huge signal like they're running an operation to make this yeah. the big boogeyman or yeah. worse. But what they actually, all that documentation in that film are portraying is that Christian nationalism is 
worse than January 6th for the country, but in fact is also the, the primary cause. Not Donald Trump. They're even willing to let MAGA and Donald Trump go. The thread that ties everything that happened on January 6th together, according to a lawyer named Andrew Seidel, who submitted this to the House Select Committee on January 6th, the thread that ties everything that happened on January 6th together is Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. And if we don't stop Christian nationalism as a, as, as a federal government, then the uh, the country actually he says will will not survive. He says it's not possible to have America and a Christian nation at the same time. So, so, so I have a quick question about this real quick because this is um, this is something that I don't get at all. Which you could fill up uh, the Grand Canyon with the things that I don't know. But what what I don't get at all is where do they get off suggesting that January sixth has anything to do with Christian nationalism? Because I don't get that. I really I and they do often try to screw with people's minds by taking a half truth and then exploiting that half truth. So it, what am I missing here in terms of what is the Christian connection with January 6th like at all? Yeah, well, it's it's a lot of insinuation and it's a lot of very expansive definitions and manipulation uh, having read these documents. I will tell you, by the way, what you just said is the nugget of uh, that I the first big nugget I pulled out of Beneath Sheep's Clothing, which is in the film, but it's in the book is uh, Julie Beeling, this is her her line, communism always marries a truth to a lie. Yeah. And that's just a perfect expression of how they behave, and that's what they do. So they give this long description of how scary Christian nationalism is without, and, and how bad January 6th was without getting into the nitty-gritties of it yet. Then they start to define it, and when they start to define it, their definition kind of skews all over the place. And when I say they, I'm literally yeah. talking about, again, the document presented by Andrew Seidel from the Freedom From Religion Foundation to the House Select Committee of January 6th and whatever the date was, March of 22 or whatever the date was. Um, this is an actual document. I can send you the document if you want it. Um, I, I, you can go find the document very easily by typing in Andrew Seidel's name and then House Select Committee and Christian Nationalism. It, it, anybody can go find this thing in five minutes and read it if they want. So the definition they give is extremely broad. They, yeah. they, they spend a page and a half going after Eric Metaxas, for example, because he was leading, you know, previous marches in D.C. that were Christian oriented. I forgot, not the March for Life, but some other, you know, thing where the bunch of Christians went to D.C. and um, lots of praying and pray for our nation and actually saying this is a Christian nation and all of these yeah, kinds of things. Yeah, the horror of it all, praying for But then they expand that out to if a public official, for example, let's just pull one, Marjorie Taylor Greene comes to mind immediately, uh, were to say, and I don't know if she's she's got to be specifically named in the doc, documentary or the document because she said she's a Christian nationalist, but um, she, let's say that she, you invited her to a dinner function there in in the area she showed up and she said let's open with a prayer and she you know or whatever and she's the one giving the prayer and she says you know nothing more than this lord bless this food to our bodies and bless this nation in jesus name that's it the whole prayer that's imagine that's the whole prayer and we know all know that's not what it would be because she's a congresswoman and she invoked jesus's name to bless the nation that's christian nationalism yeah in other words their definition is as broad as you could possibly imagine then they start saying well here's these nooses and these um you know gallows and here's these people carrying confederate flags and here's these people carrying christian flags and here's these people all marching on the capitol and here they are talking about God and Christianity and save the nation, God's country, blah, blah, blah. And it's just group after group after group after group after group. They show how that they were expressing religious views or holding a Christian flag. And they create this really warped narrative that Christian nationalism is the, is the thread that tied everybody together. Not MAGA, not Trump, Christian nationalism. And the punchline of the whole document is that what do we need to do to stop this? Well, he says two things. First thing we need to do is to enforce separation of church and state more thoroughly, by which he specifically means holding public officials to account so that they can't express their Christianity in public. So Marjorie Taylor Greene can be a Christian, and she can be a Christian who is a congresswoman, but she cannot go give a prayer, mm. a Christian prayer at an event 
in her capacity as a congresswoman, maybe even as a private citizen while being a congresswoman. That would be a violation. So what a, a massive chilling effect on the ability for public officials to express and, and live their faith, which is obviously a huge 1A violation. But nevertheless, that's the direction they say that they want to go under the doctrine of separation of church and state. The second thing that they say uh, is that we've got to monitor churches uh, in case they are hotbeds of domestic extremism like January 6th. In other words, what that boils down to is we must create a registered church versus the independent churches in the language of Soviet Union, um, which resonates with a second document that was submitted to the federal government about Christian nationalism that actually came from people allegedly inside the church. Now, conservative Christians who are hip to what's going on would probably say that they're not really Christians or whatever. Yeah. Um that they're heretics or whatever they want to say. But the ma matter of the fact is they have big church and seminary affiliations. I forget, there's about 20 of them wrote this thing together, submitted it, and it makes, from from inside the house, and it makes basically the same call. There's a huge problem boiling up within Christianity. Now, of course, these are the same people that tried to drag Christianity woke, like the Southern Baptist Convention and so on, yeah. you know, five years ago. And now they're saying, oh, there's this huge problem. David yeah. French I mean, is not the way, one of them, I, I don't I, think. I, but. I, by the way, I think this is funny because we're hearing about Christian nationalism like 20 minutes ago, but we never heard about Christian nationalism when Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton were clearly manipulating people using Christianity and using race to, uh, to try to influence elections. Right. So what you get, the, the vibe of this second document, though, is there's a huge problem. This one is the one that's not from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, from an outright atheist. To the, This is from allegedly church leaders who Christians would recognize many of their names as some of the problem children of woke Christianity that pretended to be conservative primarily for the last, you know, half decade. Yeah. But they are saying, in effect— what we need is that the major conventions need to be doing the equivalent of church discipline to make sure everybody's online. They're saying we need to build a registered church. Yeah. And so when you put these things together, you get this very clear sense of what's likely to happen. Some stupid event, whether it's through an infiltrated church, you can imagine an FBI agent infiltrating a church the same way the KGB infiltrated Soviet churches. You can imagine yeah. that. I'm not saying that it's happening or happened. I'm, you can imagine it causing some kind of a ruckus, something gets out of control, you get a viral video that looks like George Floyd dying. Next thing you know, Christian nationalism's this huge, what they call in the literature, reflexive environment in the media. Everybody's talking about it, oh my gosh. Then they have all these yahoos who have been putting out books saying crazy things, doing podcasts saying crazy things, building secret societies, promoting it, that they can point to and say, look, it's a huge movement. It's well-funded. You see articles about this in The Guardian popping up every now and then, so you know they're building out the narrative, and they have the some of the evidence that they're going to misconstrue. And you say, though, some of them are neo-Confederates. Some of them are kinists. Some of them are racists. Some of them are, you know, it's all there. And they're going to blow all this up, and then what would you do? Well, those recommendations from Andrew Seidel become very real. Maybe you can't limit the expression of faith from public officials because of 1A and there's lawsuits. They maybe try. They, the left likes to just do a thing and then, you know, make the courts walk them back. But what I think is more relevant is that you'll see these major convention type church institutions to fill in the role of the registered church. Hey, everybody under our convention discipline, if you want to be a member of, let's say, the Southern Baptist Convention, or if you want to be a member of the Presbyterian Church of America, or whatever it happens to be, yeah. if you want to be a member, we have these guidelines you have to keep. We have this, that, and the other thing about gender, race, sex, sexuality, and so on. So we know that you're not going to be participating in domestic extremism. And so the government's like, oh, well, you're, an, you're a convention church. You get a check mark. You're the registered church. It's the Soviet language. But the independent churches, however, well, we got to keep an eye on those because, you know, bad things are happening. There's some kind of a domestic violent extremist event that bubbled up out of one. That's where the problem of right wing extremism and white nationalism, which they'll bleed back and forth between Christian and white right. nationalism fluidly, um, that's where it's coming from in the country. And now we have all the evidence, and that's what caused J6, and it's the biggest threat to our democracy, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, whether it's just a narrative environment or whether they're actually able to start, you know, doing some aspect of within 
the furthest stretch that you can take First Amendment monitoring and controlling of independent churches, pressuring independent churches to join the the registered convention churches, monitoring Christian groups. Oh, you have a Bible study or whatever. Well, maybe you're being on an FBI watch list now um, because you're doing that as part of an independent church that's um, we don't know if what you're actually creating is a plot to kidnap the governor or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the kind of environment that the Soviets created around churches. And this is the kind of environment in China, they have this thing called the Three Selfs Church, which is totally like communist whack, fake. It's a registered church in Soviet language. And this is how they do these things in communist countries, is they create a official version that only does state propaganda. Uh, and then everybody else is regarded as some level of enemy of the state and is either investigated or pressured or infiltrated with false flags. The guy, Timothy, from Soviet Union, um, in, in Beneath Sheep's Clothing talks about the KGB infiltrating churches and then rising up to cause an uprising from the church. So then the church has to be shut down and destroyed because that church went radical against the state. But it yep. wasn't. It was a KGB agent inside that caused all the problems. And then, you know, next thing you know, literally, because it was Soviet Union, they were bulldozing the church um, and, you know, shutting it down. And then every single person that was a member of that church is on the KGB watch list and being investigated. He talks about how... Um, because they were members of a dissident church, uh, the KGB, all of their neighbors were to report anytime anybody came to or left their house, all their doings, all of it had to be reported to the KGB. Anybody who visited by name, what time they were there, how long they stayed, um, the whole thing, all had to be reported to KGB all the time because they were members of a dissident church. And I don't know what their investigative and, and, and surveillance capacity would be here, but that is a end point for that uh this kind of op if it's taken in a really bad direction so what i fear is that that um it, we can call it a left-wing conspiracy theory it has enough evidence to get off the ground but what it actually is the correct word is is that it's it is a leftist active measure against independent mm. religious belief and religious liberty well that's super interesting so even if it doesn't go to the degree that you're talking about with registered churches, or maybe even if maybe what I'm about to say is just one step closer toward that. The one thing I can tell you that is 100% happening um, it, within the church after 22 years of ministry, what I can tell you is happening is something very interesting that actually Aaron Wren uh, uh, illustrated. Are you familiar with Aaron Wren at all? I know who he is, yeah. Okay, so Christian journalist, um, and he did some reporting on a book by a guy named Tim Alberta. I don't really remember the name of the book, but it has something to do with the Lord's Prayer, like uh, the... Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that is something that uh, that has to do with the Lord's Prayer? Anyway, in it, um, he he quotes this interaction between a group of core evangelical leaders, and and I, I want to read this to you, and then I want to get your thoughts about it. And he says this: One afternoon, while hiking the Gray Whale Cove Trail along the spectacular San Mateo Coast, Chang, who is a uh, professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, and um, I believe in some kind of pastoral capacity out in California, um, laid it all out for French, and that's David French, the journalist, uh, Christian journalist, supposedly Christian journalist. There needed to be an organized, visible, well-funded effort to counter the work done by the likes of Charlie Kirk, Eric, Eric Metaxas, Ralph Reed, David Barton, they forgot to name me, which is really disappointing, and me other too. MAGA right people. Uh, Change didn't envision some puritanical campaign to banish politics from the church altogether. What he hoped to articulate was an alternative to the manic enemy at the gates mindset that was infecting American evangelicalism. So kind of the, the Christians calling for culture war, he, how do we get rid of that? How do we undo that? This would best be accomplished by a systemic curriculum, something that could be studied by individuals and small groups, something focused not on the who or the what of politics, but on the question of how Christians are called to engage the culture. All of this is just incredibly 
subversive. Uh, Chang began to entertain a strange idea. What if unbelievers fitted, footed the bill for this project? Walking into his initial meetings with secular funders, Chang halfway wondered if he was losing his mind. There were some of that same people who couldn't fathom vaccine hesitancy among evangelicals, who had zero understanding of the church's conflicts regarding politics, policy, and culture. Now they were going to bankroll his Christian curriculum enterprise. Yes, that's what all of them said. Yes, in retrospect, Chang told me it shouldn't have been a surprise. So all that to say this is uh, Tim Alberta is exposing a group of evangelical Christians who were well funded by unbelievers who are not named in the book. Um, one might think of Reed Hoffman or something like that. Uh, but we're well funded by uh, a group of people outside the church, not necessarily to try to um, punish white evangelical men or to try to accuse people of being Christian nationalists and to separate yourself from that, but to do something much more subtle, to change the way in which Christians talk about politics within the church so that they can push people further close to the Democratic Party to vote along Democratic lines, to make it more tolerable, in other words, to be a, a Christian conservative and to vote Democrat. So what what Aaron Wren explains here is a very coordinated effort among people like Tim Keller, uh, people like uh, Russell Moore of Christianity Today, um, and others like Francis Collins, who are using money from outside influences, also government funded institutions, to infiltrate the church to try to push them towards an ideological um, kind of uh, worldview. Uh, that is, is at home on the left more so than anything else. So the one thing that I consistently see is Christian nationalism being used as an extortive tactic to try to manipulate people, manipulate the way that they vote, manipulate what they think, and more importantly, manipulate their voice and culture so that they don't have an impact in what is happening. In other words, to defenestrate the culture war Christians out there who are actually trying to make a difference in the world and Christianity as a means of doing that. So my question to you in all of that is, um, what's the problem with considering our nation a Christian nation. Isn't it founded upon Christian morality? Isn't it a nation that is so inextricably connected to the Judeo-Christian values that we find in Scripture in such ways that we don't even know how much Christianity has influenced the West especially, but certainly Christianity. I think about Douglas Murray and his comments that were, uh, his kind of offhand comment that where the hell do you think civil rights came from if it didn't come from Christian Scripture? Um, uh, my question to you is, is, is there a problem considering our nation a Christian nation, which I think ultimately that's what Christian nationalists are really doing. Well, I mean, there is a danger, which is an artificial danger that's being created by this, uh, instead of using the word op that I use on, on Twitter, that this active measure that is, I, I think, quite clearly being foisted uh, upon upon. Christianity at large in the United States. Um, so there's a there's an artificial danger that that term is becoming a term of art for a hostile will that wants to control uh, Christians exactly the same way that you just outlined from that article. And you know I point out and kind of in parallel, they you you brought up Claudine Gay and we talked about uh, Christian academics being pushed out of the the universities. They don't like independent thinking. Mm -hmm. We saw that overwhelmingly with COVID. People who were doing their own research, doctors who went rogue, so to speak, by actually just assessing evidence and questioning some of the things that were coming out, they don't like independent research. They also are not going to want independent belief. Um, so kind of in response, not to answer your question specifically about the history and philosophy, we can come back to that. And I, I'm more than happy to do so. I'm not trying to dodge that. No. Uh, I want to read, as you were reading the, the thing from Aaron Wren, I want to read to you something else, and I'll tell you who said it after the fact and tell you what you actually made me think of. This is about half of a paragraph from a speech, uh, and it says, although large numbers of intellectuals have made progress, they should not be complacent. They must continue to remold themselves, gradually shed their bourgeois world outlook and acquire the proletarian communist world outlook so that they can fully fit in with the needs of the new society and unite with the workers and the peasants. 
The change in world outlook is fundamental, and up till now, most of our intellectuals cannot be said to have accomplished it. We hope that they will continue to make progress and that in the course of their work they, and study, they will gradually acquire the communist world outlook, grasp Marxism-Leninism, and become integrated with the workers and peasants. We hope that they will not stop halfway or, what is worse, slide back, for there will be no future for them in going backwards. So this was Mao Zedong giving a very famous speech in 1957. Uh, warning people that if they didn't take up the practice of what the Chinese call shui shi, which is study, but specifically it meant the, the, the study of Marxism, Leninism, and current affairs through the communist lens, the study of Maoism, that if you weren't taking up the aspect as an intellectual of study, then you were not advancing in your socialism and in your communism, and that, that that's a big problem. But even worse, you might start to ask questions. You might start to think independently, or in other words, slide backwards out of your brainwashing into Marxism, Leninism, and, and Chinese communism. And his, his, he makes a very clear point for there will be no future for them in going backwards. And that's the mentality that I thought of when you were when you were reading this. You're like, oh, we're going to figure out. We're not just going to come in and say they're misinterpreting things. We're going to create study session or study programs for them to be able to study how to interpret the word yeah. correctly. That's registered church stuff. We're going to come in rather than enforcing a registered church. We're just going to create study materials to the correct interpretation, and people will want to. You know, Christians will need to go through the process of, of shui shi. They'll need to study to be able to get the right interpretation, to get the right view of what it means to be a Christian, and woe be unto them should they slide backwards should they go in their own independent way should they think differently from what what we're saying that's the whole thing that i thought when you were reading that analysis from yeah. ren talking about david french and his program um you know the conservative case for for maoist takeover of christianity is his next article probably but um <laughs> one can expect yeah one can expect front page of the new york times and so uh them not liking independence is a major issue here. Now, the question of whether or not we should consider the United States a Christian nation is a complicated question because it is undeniably a culturally Christian nation, but it is also undeniably not a religiously Christian nation. But we don't, unlike with, say, the Jewish religion, we don't make that distinction mm -hmm. uh, as clearly. Um, all of our stories, all of our, I mean, we, we're obviously extremely welcoming. We are uh, politically secular. The government is not to favor one religion over another. I think that I can, in a very, very short time, convince you that we don't want the government favoring one religion over the other. And all I have to say, really, is two words, registered church. Um, look at what the state's doing now. Even with the matter of, do you want the Bible taught in schools? A lot of Christians do. Some of the people who I know who are the most against it, more against it than I am, are not atheists. They're, in fact, Christians, because they don't want the state choosing somebody who is doctrinally incorrect to disciple their kids. And I have to admit, they have a pretty good point. Mm -hmm. They have a really good point, actually, that the state might choose wrongly in one of two ways. They might choose somebody who's, in the terms we're using, registered church, but they also might choose somebody who's just incompetent. I guess a third way, they might choose somebody who's doctrinally not aligned. Why should a Methodist be telling, you know, Baptist kids what the Bible means? Yeah. Uh, why, well, well, let, let me let me ask you a question about this because uh, through this we can hopefully get to a understanding of what Christian nationalism is and why I think it's not such a dirty term if we understand what we're actually talking about. Um, uh, so. What would be, and I know this is a highfalutin idea, but, and, and there's much more nuance involved in this idea, but if we truly are a pluralistic society, if we love the public square to be a place where ideas can be discussed and all of those things, I can envision a world in which we allow um, the free discourse and discussion of ideas to take place where we allow the best ideas to emerge and those be the things that we actually discuss. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is, okay, let the Methodist and the Baptist hash it out. I don't know what that mechanism actually looks like. I'll just be honest with you, but I'm just saying, let's, let's let 
our society operate the way we say it's supposed to, and then let's let those ideas be disseminated. I can envision, even in the public school system, where there's a class on religion, like God forbid, right? I mean, it is a part of every single culture in the history of the world since, the, since as far as we can tell. Um, and we have the Buddhist guy come in. Let's let him give his best case for Buddhism. Let's let the Christian Methodist, the Christian Baptist, whatever. Let's let them come in. Let's let them share. Let's let them debate. And let's have us hear the case for why um, these ideas should stand, um, uh, should stand in, in the face of scrutiny. So um, I, I just wonder if we really believed in a pluralistic society, if um, if, if we wouldn't allow these ideas to be discussed openly rather than to just immediately make them taboo. Because the reality is, is I think you can say that we're separating church and state or that we're trying to be impartial or, or whatnot or trying to be um, even protective of, of orthodoxy. But what we're doing actually is we're just securing a space for heterodoxy, for leftist social, socialism and, and for them to sweep in in, in the guise of kind of secular agnosticism, we're letting them sweep in and take that space and then teach their ideological nonsense, because that's actually what's happening in the public school. That is what's actually happening, is that they have hidden the fact that they have a cult religion and that, and that, they're, that they are teaching, um, and they have hidden that in the fact that it's allegedly uh, secular philosophy and economics, which it's not. It's not social theory. What they are teaching is it's literally not even a religion. It's a cult. Um, it's the doctrine of a cult. It's easy to show. But they've tricked all of society for 200 years on that yeah. point, which is, is a phenomenal uh, achievement on their part in some sense. But what the reason that I would push back on what you've said is because we're dealing with children and we're also dealing with limited curriculum time. Um, Fair enough. I do want to, I would love to see those debates happening with adults or even maybe young adults. I don't know where the line gets drawn, upper end of high school or whatever, where you start to have that critical thinking skill developed, but not in eight-year-olds. Um, they're not ready. They're not ready to get barraged with 12 religions and have to try to figure out which one they, they're, they're going to choose by which one sounded the best and who had the coolest outfit. Like, yeah. it's not the way, they're not, they're not, they're not mature enough for that. The, so the discipleship process um, is is very important you know, to to reserve, I think, to where the fundamental right to the upbringing of a child lies, which is with the parent, not with a state institution. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of comparative religion, actually, as a subject. Uh, and I, I disagree, actually, with my very Christian friends who are against the idea of the Bible being taught in school. I think, for example, following Douglas Murray, although how you would create this curriculum and satisfy people, I'm not sure. I don't think it's possible to talk about the American civic program, which you should be talking about American schools, not through Howard Zinn. You should be talking about it legitimately. <laughs> this is how the system works. But you can't talk about that system without going properly, like our founders did, into the history, talking about the Greek ideas, talking about the Roman ideas of law, and talking about the Judeo-Christian principles that all came together to form what is our American civic system. So the Bible becomes, in a very real sense, a touch point just to understand the basis of our civic mor our, our civic law and morality. And if you don't do that, you can't teach the subject correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you say, well, what about the children question? Well, the fact is we don't teach civics. I mean, we teach very generic, like this is the three branches of government, like in junior high or whatever. We don't teach civics until I took it as a senior in high school. That was the year everybody took it when I went through high school. That's an upper end course to actually learn. We don't really do civics. So we, they changed it from civics to government, and it became kind of this, you know, waste of time class everybody had to take. Yep. But taught correctly, it's already an upper end high, end of high school course, which you totally could get into that kind of discussion in a mature way with young adults that they're emerging adults or whatever the term is for 17 year olds. And, um, I'm in more favor of that than most of my kind of Christian friends who are very much like, no, do not let the school have this power. They will, they will definitely abuse it. Um, but I also fully agree with you that what's happening in our schools right now is the promotion, the unvarnished promotion. In fact, the brainwashing of children into an ideology that is not America. I mean, if you want to say there's always that happening, I don't think that's totally true. But I think that one of the fundamental purposes of education is the exact thing the communists complained about and convinced generations now of Americans to think is a problem. 
and that is what they call the problem of reproduction. The communists went after this vigorously starting in the 70s and 80s, and they actually overcame it by the 90s and early 2000s. But the problem of reproduction is that the schools reproduce society from one generation to the next. You mm -hmm. teach your kids to be, you know, to hold the values and uh, your civic values and your to understand the civic processes of your society. You teach your children skills relevant to getting a job in your society. You teach children how uh, you're expected to behave culturally in your society. And the left said, well, what about all the other cultures? That's wrong. You shouldn't be so exclusive no, actually, the point of an American institution like a school is to generate Americans. So you should actually be exclusive in that regard. And no, you don't have to open the door to what about the poor this and the poor that and the migrants and the indigenous and the everything else. And the, that was one of the most successful lies they've ever pulled off. And they are actually not even indoctrinating, but brainwashing into a cult religion now because we were asleep at the gate. Um I don't know if for sure what the answer to that looks like. I think we're still in the clarifying the problem stage. And if you don't know what the problem is, you're going to make the wrong solution. Right. But um, I'm, like I said, more warm to the idea that we should have the Bible as a, as a culturally Christian touchpoint and civic foundation should be covered. Like, what's its yeah. relevance? Why? But again, you've got to be very cautious not to get doctrinal about that, yeah. especially with younger kids. And then when you get to older kids, you can kind of hash some of that out. And I'd love to see that, like, instead of all this, like, blah, blah, blah studies. Oh, I didn't take American history. I took East Indian studies. Like, shut up. <laughs> no, it's time to take yeah. a Western civilization. It's time to take American history. And if you want to take, you know, foundational American civics could be a, just a fabulous course where there's your choices right there if you want to satisfy your general education requirements in, in history and civics. Yeah. I was required. It was not an option. I had to take American history specifically. Western Civ was an option, but um, it didn't fulfill the requirement. I had to take American history. Uh, and I think that this is actually something pretty important that we need to be getting back to and getting rid of all of these ridiculous things that satisfy the requirements yeah. and in the college space i'd love to see the kind of thing that you're talking about um because you're dealing with young adults at that point they do need to start they're going to encounter those arguments nine-year-olds don't need to know how to hash out the difference between yeah, Buddhism and, and baptist um it's just like that guy's trying to be nice and he's not going to take advantage of you that's like more or less all you need to know you know yeah um and yeah. th that's another thing the left does, by the way, even with this, but also with the sexuality stuff, is they just push it on kids way too early, way, way too early. Mm -hmm. um, but, okay, your question was, you know, is this a Christian nation, and what does that mean, and why is it defensible? And I think I kind of already implicitly answered it, but just to be really clear, our our civic arrangement, our law, and our kind of public ethic are built off of this kind of very well thought out, um, very kind of miraculously harmonious combination as, you know, to paraphrase uh, Ben Shapiro of uh, Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome. And yeah. we can't leave the Jerusalem part out of that, which is not just the Jewish part, but it is. I mean, the most commonly cited book by our founders is Leviticus. Yeah. So that's Jewish law. And then we go on and, you know, the the gospel, I think, leads into a lot of our civic structure. Like you said, where do you think civil rights came from, if not from the Bible, both Old and New Testament? And so we can't understand what America is, what America was meant to be, without understanding that it was built on a Christian substrate. Um, so I don't know that pushing this concept of culturally Christian is beneficial. I don't want to like upset people with that. Um, I don't know if it's the right path, but the fact of the matter is that we are a Christian, uh, culturally Christian nation, yeah. but we are not a religiously, and we're certainly not a theocratically Christian nation. And the problem with what gets called Christian nationalism is, and I mean this with all honesty, not just from characters on the left like Andrew Seidel pushing this to the J6 committee, the definitions are all over the place. It's, yeah. it's not wh which one of these is correct. It's literally that all of them are correct at the same time, not even necessarily from different people. Like, for example, you know, the case for Christian nationalism has a very extreme case presented by Stephen Wolf. Stephen Wolf argues that he's doing it as an intellectual exercise. I've seen Stephen Wolf talk about the book in person, physically in the room, watched him give a talk. He backpedals a ton of it and says, well, you know, maybe that's 
you know, it's just an intellectual exercise. And then when he presents as a much, you know, milder case, which one of those two things does he mean? Yeah. The answer, honest, honestly, the answer is with with no shade thrown at, at, at Stephen for this, it's both. Yeah. But that's a problem because it's a very unclear environment. And then the, the federal government is weaponizing this lack of clarity. And I guarantee you what they're going to do is cast the broadest net and then everybody caught by that enormously broad net is going to get hooked up into the most extreme thing any idiot ever said. <laughs> yeah. Because that's, that's, their, that's their MO when they do this. And that's just to you know, hit the point again. That's Cheka stuff. That is, yeah. that is straight up Soviet tactics to, to crush opposition. This has been my frustration from the very beginning with the Christian nationalism thing that kind of tipped me off to it is that very rarely whenever anybody uses the term will you hear them actually define the term. And that's what kind of motivated the question um, kind of about the way in which our nation has been founded and who we are as a people because it, it, because you could ask me the question, are you a Christian nationalist, Reed? And I would tell you it depends on what you mean by that, because it is so rarely defined. I don't know what you mean when you say the word. And I almost, like you say, I, I would be willing to bet, if I was a betting man, uh, that the the obscurity is intentional, that it, that it is uh, it is murky on purpose because it is a libel. It's it's crystal knocked, right? It's a way to try to make somebody seem something that that they're not for manipulative political gain. Um, so so I think it's important to kind of have this conversation about like what is Christian nationalism actually, and and from what I hear you saying, and I, I not, let me just put you out of the equation because I don't want to misrepresent you. And I'll just say in terms of me, if you tell me um, we're, we're, we want a theocracy, well, then I'm not on board with you. If you tell me, you know, we're going to implement laws to where you have to go to church on Sunday or something like that. We're going to make sure that everybody who comes to this nation is a quote unquote Christian. We're going to reinstall Christendom as it were. Um, then I'm not on board with you. If you tell me that based upon the name, uh, nationalism, we believe that our nation is held together by a culture, a shared culture. Well, then, yes, I'm a nationalist. Obviously, that is true. Our nation is held together by a shared culture, which includes religion, language, and all these other things. Um, and then if you say, well, Christian nationalists, you add to that. So what is shared about our culture? Well, it is undeniable to me that if you come to America, even if you are not a Christian, you are going to be a benefactor of Christian ideas and Christian virtues that have gone into the founding of our nation, again, in ways that are so inextricable that we don't even completely understand how much Christianity has impacted this nation, enough to, I think, where it's safe to say that if Christianity never existed, America would not exist. I think that's a fair enough statement, but, um, and, and maybe the people could argue that, but suffice to say, I, I do think it, it's undeniable that our nation is inextricably um, connected to Christianity, I think from a moral standpoint, um, culturally even more so from a theological standpoint. Um, and, and I bring, to, to back this up, I bring up John Adams's quote, that our government is made for a religious and moral people, and it is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And I think John Adams is just simply saying there that our constitution, our declaration of independence, our founding, um, presupposes a Christian moral virtue without which it doesn't necessarily work. And then I would say I'm Christian nationalist in, in the next part of that, that I think as our nation becomes more post-Christian, it starts to work less. And again, I'm not asking for theocracy. Um, so, and so hopefully this is clear. It's kind of a difficult thing to explain. But what I am asking is that we be honest about the fact that Christian morality is important to our nation. And it has actually fueled the American experiment, which is one of, I don't think too arguably, uh, one of the greatest experiments that's ever you know, happened in the history of the world. So I'm curious about your thoughts about that. Well, I mean, that's kind of what I was touching into with the idea of cultural Christianity and foundational uh, aspects of our civic and, and social life uh, and, and the organization of our law. So I, I do think that that is largely true. I actually think part of the secret sauce is this kind of open invitation that if you want to come here and at the end of the day be American, and the question becomes, well, what does that mean? Well, it does mean tempering a lot of religious impulses uh 
across the board, including Christian ones. If you want to come here and be American, let's go. We're on the same team. You know, I, I think of this guy and I don't want to make it, you know, so base and crass, but I, I read at one point and I have no idea where I read this. So I apologize for the lack of citation. I'm not Claudine Gay. I'm just <laughs> stupid sometimes, but it was, you mean America means I can come and be whoever I want and tell the president to go F himself. And all I have to do is try to be productive and make money and it's good. I'm like, yep. There you go. You know, that's the basic idea is, and it's not just about making money. It's, you know, build a life, be productive. I mean, kind of the American ethos is get a job. <laughs> that's yeah. literally kind of what, what we're about. It's like pro be productive to the society. Now, of course, it is a, a very biblical uh, concept as well, frankly. It, 100%. It, it, it really is. A man is. will not work, he shall not eat. Yeah, so I'm, I'm okay with this uh, idea of this kind of, a cultural Christianity. I'm. Well, we're going to end up on an FBI watch list for this. <laughs> I'm already on all of them, but um, but B, um, this idea that we are truthful about where our our civic culture came from, I think, is absolutely necessary. Like, why lie about it? Um, you know, when we talk about the Constitution, the Constitution was designed intentionally to have a light touch. Uh, its purpose is not to limit the people, but to limit the government in how much it can do with the people. And therefore, the people have liberty. But the, uh, this isn't just to be quaint. Um, the beginning of liberty is actually a responsibility. So if you are not a moral people at the very least, and understand that taking a responsibility for your environment, whether, whether that's physically, you know, to take care of yourself, whether that's um, taking care of and raising your children, but also the, the community, the moral environment that you're in around you. Um, if you're not taking responsibility for it, none of this works. Uh, you, you can't have liberty with a bunch of libertines running around, basically, because they'll spoil it for everybody. Um, and the experiment in America was like, well, let's not get the government too involved in any of this. Let's try to let people work it out themselves. Now, John Adams is a funny character with his religious, moral and religious people, wholly inadequate quote, because it's, again, what does Christian nationalism mean? Well, if, if you stay on the very kind of light touch end, it's like, okay, yeah, that's great. But if you get more to the, you know, well, we're going to be doctrinally orthodox or we're going to make this part of the government and, you know, more strict— Turns out John Adams wouldn't qualify. John Adams was a Unitarian. He denied the divinity of Jesus. He didn't believe in the Trinity. Like he's, which is welcome to America, bro. Get a job. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like who cares? The idea is really that you know, okay, so that's your crackpot religious beliefs, or maybe they're legit religious beliefs. I'm in no position, being not God, to judge that. So, you know, um, get a job. And actually, there's another part, which is not not totally bring who you are with you. But try to mix in, try to blend in, try to fit in. Um, if you want to come, you know, create an Ethiopian enclave and have Ethiopian restaurants and little Ethiopia or whatever a neighborhood, that's fine. And also, guess what? You're an American. So uh, try to make it work in the American context. So there, there is this, uh, I think also that the left has been very good at convincing us, there is this right to a cultural hegemony mm -hmm. that any culture or nation has and that it has a right to maintain that as a matter of its own survival and if we're again honest about the foundations of the american cultural hegemony it is this peculiar combination of you know the allegedly the reason of athens and the the virtues of but also the greek virtues but the specifically the virtues of um jerusalem yeah. and we I agree with you. This country, I don't think this country would have existed without Christianity. That's, that's, I don't even think that's a question. Um, it's very, very clear that the, the founders of this country built their thought off of essentially how do we create a secular republic that doesn't infringe upon people's religious liberty, that being a major issue for them, um, where religion actually, and Christianity in particular, was the foundation and should be able to thrive. Yeah. Um, in fact, that was sort of the point of keeping the state out of it is so that it can thrive um, according to its own 
uh, pursuit of conscience in its own reading, the, the free reading of Scripture to say, well, you know, it looks like it says this, and it doesn't look like it says that, and let's hash it out. Well, you don't agree. That's okay. I'm going to do a church, and we're going to go do the experiment over here, and you can have your church over there. And that, that I think that was really behind a lot of that that ethos. Now I I know they would counter. It is true that there were, that the federal government was prohibited from establishing a church, but the states were not. Um, that's a complicated affair. Uh, people say, well, if you don't like your state, like let's say that Tennessee decides it's going to be pretty hardcore Baptist, and I don't really want to be a Baptist, so like, do I have to move to Kentucky? Like, yeah, it's not really easy to just uproot your life, and it's really a lot of an imposition to say you have to move to a completely other state because your state decided you're going to have a belief system that you everybody has to follow. And I know the Tennessee state constitution says some stuff on this point that we kind of just straight out ignore. I think it yeah. may have been nullified by the federal government, actually. Um, there was a series of those things that happened. But um, that's a that's a, a kind of a separate issue uh, to the question, because Tennessee is also not the nation, um, to, the, to the question of whether or not this is a Christian nation. What I will say, though, is even if we believe that this nation is a Christian nation and we want to proclaim that from the rooftops, like let's say we're fully in on that, and we mean it in the kind of culturally, foundationally way, Christian ethics, Christian morals, not necessarily Christian belief, but ideally they're connected in a lot of cases, um, you're going to find yourself on an FBI watch list this year. Like, I would just <laughs> tell you, I know Christians get, like, worked up about this whole, I'm not going to trim my beliefs for prudence. This isn't... The, the, it's bigger than prudence because this... This thing will be turned into a, a monster, like you said, crystal knocked, used to knock down our ability to maintain religious liberty in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we end with the registered church and the oppressions of religion that we see with the Soviet Union, but I also see that that's not off the table whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it's really concerning, and it just seems unnecessary to proclaim a term that the left has set up as yeah. as a I'm worried about as a that label. Too. Yeah. I'm worried about that too. I but the only reason I hang on to it and the only reason I would say in some way you can classify me as that is because I'm not going to let them usurp language and just do whatever they want to with it. Now maybe that's naive and uh the the jury's already out as far as that's concerned, but um but I want to fight the lie that white supremacy is the greatest threat fa facing our oh, nation sure. right now. Uh, and, and I want to fight the lie that Christian nationalism is worse than Al Qaeda. Uh, and I want to fight for, and it's probably a losing battle as far as I'm concerned, but maybe not for somebody who has a platform like you. Um, I want to fight um, the lie of Christian nationalism. And predominantly, maybe, maybe not predominantly, but certainly one of the reasons is because I think that we are fraying at the edges of a nation as a nation right now. And I don't think it's entirely Donald Trump. And by the way, I think a lot of what we're experiencing right now was precipitated by Barack Obama anyway. Uh, but I think we're fraying at the edges right now because we don't know what to agree on. We're making so many so much about diversity right now. And that's fine to some degree, diversity, whatever, if, especially if you're talking about diversity of thought. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, let's have the conversation. But what we underestimate is, is that the thing that brings us as a nation together is not our diversity. Um, what brings us together is those things which we have in common, those things which we share. And so I don't even completely know what this looks like entirely. But when I talk about Christian nationalism, what I mean is that I think originally there was a very basic limited set of moral values that our nation shared in common. And I think they derived from Christian scripture. And I think the more we get away from that, we're starting to ask ourselves, well, what do we really have in common? Uh, wh wh what makes us, what, what, what do we share any, anymore? Now, again, I, I can be accused of over, being overly simplistic in my thinking here because perhaps this post-Christian experiment has been going, been going on much longer than I, than I think. But I think you go back to the 1950s, the 1960s even, and you see a nation that is mostly in accord when it comes to what they think marriage is supposed to look like, when they think the family is supposed to look like. And I see more recently things like, well, let me just read this quote from Gramsci. Um, 
when he said socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I see that I see ultimately in recent past, I see those shared things no longer being shared by the majority of Americans anymore. And I see that. I see yeah, we're trying to replace Christianity with a different religion, and it's not yeah. working. Yeah, I sadly I even see that happening within within the church. I mean, there's always doctrinal disagreements and interpretation disagreements and all of this, but the amount of um, social gospel, for example, or liberation theology uh, in one form or another that's crept in and has divided the church um, is also profound. I mean, I don't know how many pictures yeah. I saw in the past two years of drag queens preaching from the pulpit in a various various churches, and it's like, whew, that's holy, holy moly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, holy ridiculous, holy ridiculous with a W. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's very, it's very much infiltrate and subvert, infiltrate and subvert. And that's what Gramsci's whole method actually was. Um, and unfortunately we are in a precarious point. I, I don't know if I see a nation fraying at the edges as much as I see one that's being provoked. I feel very much like there's, uh, since we're using the idea of like a fabric, somebody going along with kind of a, a hooked needle, like pulling threads out, mm -hmm. pulling threads out, and they say, oh, look how frayed it is, and they pull a thread out, look how frayed it is. Um, everything's falling apart, so we need to have, you know, a new order, and they pull out another couple threads, and then there's a loose thread, and the, you know, BLM found a loose thread, and they just pulled the whole thing unraveled around that one. Um, so I still feel very much like we haven't realized that there is a, and it would be kind of technical, I guess, you know, fifth generational or political warfare, or unrestricted warfare assault happening largely from within due to the long march to the institutions that's been happening in our country that really kicked off in the late sixties. The radicalism of the late sixties did not have its intended effect. So then they went underground literally they went into education at all levels they went into yeah. different professions are you talking about, are you referring to the sds i'm referring in just in general to the long march of the institutions i was actually yeah. picturing uh, herbert marcuse's counter-revolution and revolt in a particular paragraph that he wrote in there okay. talking about what it should look like but what it is is that they they created in, in formal language they created the the idea of doing what are, are known as renormalization cells so yeah. you have literally socialist ideologues who won't bend who then pretend to be whatever it is to pretend to blend in and then just kind of bend the policies and in every institution around themselves slowly over time and they of course preferentially recruit until they have more power and once they have enough power they they flip the organization to what Gramsci referred to as a counter hegemony or a counter institution um, which then works against the country uh, rather than for it and then some of these, like that we've venerated for years, is just how, in a frank, in a sense, trusting, naive, and maybe even stupid we were. Like we've trusted and, and venerated the the ACLU. Yeah. Like, oh, they defended Nazis back in seventy one at Skokie <laughs> or whatever it was. Um, yeah, it was created by Harry Ward, who was an outright communist, who ended up having to step down for the presidency of the ACLU because he was too communist in nineteen forty nine. I mean, the ACLU isn't it didn't go bad. It stopped pretending it wasn't bad. It was bad from the start. It was a front organization all along. Yeah. And so we've fallen for a lot of these things. You know, almost everything that's got some kind of a dot .org that starts with the word council is probably terrible. <laughs> Look for every acronym that has a C in it that stands for council, and it's probably bad. It's yeah. probably a front organization. And it's just like, well, why? Because council, do you know what, do you know what the Russian word for council is? Mm. Soviet. Really? Yeah, that's the Russian word for 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 a governing council or a deciding council is Soviet. That's you see this freaking word everywhere. That's why. Um, yeah. That's what the World Economic Forum is and the United Nations. They're they're a new Soviet. Uh, but at any rate, um, we've been infiltrated and subverted, and it's it's really concerning. And we are, I think, waking up in time. I, I honestly do. I've watched the change. I've watched, I mean, Davos this year we talked about is rebuilding trust. And you were telling the story to very clearly indicate that they did not succeed at rebuilding trust. <laughs> the things yeah. they did to rebuild trust hurt trust. They're talking about disease X now. It doesn't matter 
what kind it, it could be whatever cold it could come from anywhere it doesn't have to come from a lab it doesn't have to be intentional it could be literally you know a bat soup or whatever yeah. uh, totally you know benign origin or you know organic origin disease we're going to blame them there could be a natural disaster it could be a solar flare they can't control the sun we're going to blame them yeah like rebuilding trust was them b- burning their last bridge to most of the public and um they are kind of in a weird island you know surrounded by a moat of money and power but uh we're not happy with them so i i'm actually quite hopeful i just think it's going to be a rocky ride yeah. um i do agree though that we will have to have a have something around which we can rally and come back together and start to build a shared vision for what life I think looks like, you know, everyday life looks like on the other side of it. I also, frankly, I think while we can be working on that and promoting it now, it's not going to stick yet. And so it's just going to be a very frustrating endeavor for the people that are pouring their energy into it because we haven't cleared the provocation. Yeah, that's not going to work until we clear the subversion and provocation. Yeah, um, not to say that it shouldn't be worked on and developed in the meantime, but it's just going to be a mess. And some of it, like this Christian nationalist thing, will get turned against people uh, in 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 the process and make those things less able to be the thing that people can rally around in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I think maybe the moral of the story at the end of the day for me would be. Um, my only dog in the fight, to keep on using euphemisms, would be that I would just like to see, um, and I know there's going to be people who just disregard this and think this this is not accurate, but I can only tell you from my lived experience preaching my truth that um, I would like to see once again in society uh, where Christians have the right and the freedom and the ability to... um, announce their views and their ideas, their version of morality in the public square, at least without the kind of um, unthinking ridicule that often is followed uh, by that. Uh, Anybody that has ventured into elite circles understands that Christianity is utterly unwelcome in those places. Um, And I would like us to see, I would like to see our society come to the place where, whether you want to call it Christian nationalism or not, where the best idea can win. I I don't know that we were ever there, but I think we were definitely closer to that when um, in the past than we are in in the present because there is so much subversion going on now. And I think Christian nationalism, the the attack of Christian nationalism is just another attempt to try to subvert us toward that goal. I feel confident enough, and, and I know you would probably disagree with me on this, but I feel confident enough that if given the opportunity for Christian ideas to flourish in the public square, that you won't have to talk about Christian nationalism. It stands on its own two feet. There is merit to the value and the beauty that Christianity can provide to a society in and of itself. If it is not being subverted, I think it will be able to stand up intellectually. It will be able to stand up um, experientially and um, objectively based upon the results that it can provide to a society. I think it truly can if it is allowed to flourish and allowed to um, uh, to enter into the marketplace of ideas as it should be in a free society, I think Christianity stands on its own two feet. And so that's all I would really fight for at the end of the day. And the reason I hate the attack of Christian nationalism is because I think that's yet another further attempt to ostracize the voice of Christians outside of the public square. So I think that's really all I'm kind of advocating for. Well, I got two things out of that. Um, one of them is that... Uh, you need to be on a watch list because you do dog fighting. <laughs> I had no idea that I was talking to one of those people. Um, that uh, hey FBI read is, has dogs in fights is what he said. He said that he called it a euphemism, but we all know um, I'm doing a critical theory on you. Uh, and and then the second is that I'm actually very very um, sympathetic to this marketplace of ideas, and and, and I'm very upset with the idea that, you know, Christianity just gets kind of sneered at. I think that Christianity has a ton to bring to civic life and and virtually everything. Um, I may or may not agree with you about various points of what is and is not veridically true uh, in the Christian belief structure, because if I agreed with you on all those things, I would be a Christian. 
Um, yeah, by the, by the way, you will agree with this. If you think the resurrection is implausible, just look into woke politics because it gets even crazier. Yeah, woke politics is 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 complete upside down world. It is complete nonsense. It's straight up wrong. It, it it's a cult. It's it's nothing but a cult. Um, and so I do think that society would actually flourish uh, to see this, you know, this kind of a shift. And I most strongly agree, though, that Christian nationalism as a op, so framed as an active measure, is designed specifically to associate in the uh, conscience of the body politic at large. So what do I mean by that? Mostly low information, low engagement people who get their civic, inf you know, engagement from watching a little bit of CNN, but not really paying attention and not, it's not just being low info, it's being low engagement. In other words, they don't know and they don't really care. I know tons of people, they tend to vote Democrat that are in this category. I know some that vote Republican, so it's not strictly that kind of sure. a thing. It's, you know, you tell them what's happening, you know, oh, well, blah, 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 January 6th, they're going after the people who were just on the Capitol grounds and they're inter they're like, yeah, but well, that whole thing was bad. Well, do you know what really happened? No, and I don't. I mean, I've actually had people come back and say, no, and I don't care. Yeah. I don't need to know the details to know what was bad. So that's intentionally like low information, low engagement. The goal is to get them, and it's going to be as fluid as water for people, for them to run a narrative where these low information, not you, not the guy that's online all day, not me, um, to get these low information, low engagement people to believe Christian nationalism and white nationalism are basically the same thing. So Christianity is white nationalism. It, it, it's going to be, I'm telling you, as fluid as water. And that's going to be a major portion of what this operation is about. The first time I encountered the term Christian nationalism applied to somebody that I was working with, I literally, and I was still a bit left, this was six years ago or so, literally translated it to white nationalist in my own head immediately. Yeah. Yeah, that's and intentional. They will rub those two things together until they bleed between one another again perfectly fluidly um and so i'm thinking of these kind of like low information middle of the road americans who have it's not even just that they have other things to do it's that they don't want to take the time to get clear on the issues and so you they don't want to so you're not going to convince them to get clear on the issues and those people, it will be as fluid as water to go back and forth between Christian nationalism, white nationalism, and eh, six of one, half dozen of the other, same thing. And that's by design. And it is, at the very least, let's say there is no crystal knocked involved. It's just, again, another gigantic stain on the, on, on the, the name of Christianity in the kind of disinterested public. So the, 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 the general, I don't know. I don't want to use Hegelian terms like the Geist, <laughs> the, the, the spirit of the nation is yeah. will turn further away from it on completely bogus terms that follows from information operations, active measures that you are not the target of. By the way, the, the, the if it's crystal knocked, Christians that are proclaiming Christian nationalism are the targets, and then you have your registered church concept in some form. If it's not crystal knocked. The target is the low information, low engagement politico who's going to say, yep, the whole right is a bunch of Christian nationalists, white nationalists, Nazi freaks, and we've got to stay away from all that and we've got to fight it. Yeah. yeah and also Christianity bad. And so they tell their kids Christianity is white nationalism, and then those kids are never interested in coming to church, blah, blah, blah. And that's a huge, that's the narrative op. Hopefully this has been beneficial to people, at least in the sense that it has allowed people the freedom to rethink things that they've been told. And I think you can't do that enough, um, especially, especially right now. And I thoroughly um, just want to say I enjoyed the conversation. And, and I just want to thank you, too, James, because um, I don't know who you were in a former life. I can only tell you my experience with you every single time I've ever talked with you. Um, has not been the kind of dogmatic, foolish uh, atheist that wants to sneer and mock at Christians and what they believe, but is actually willing to be open-minded about things. And unfortunately, that's um, 
It seems far too rare today. Uh, and, and again, I guess if we, if we could reclaim anything through this conversation, I would love to try to chisel away at the things that have been happening in society today that have pushed us further and further away from being able to truly enter the marketplace of ideas and discuss these things in an, in an open and honest way. Uh, before I close out our time, is there anything that you have on your horizon that you would want anybody to know? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things, actually. Um, so we already talked about Beneath Sheep's Clothing, so that should be coming this spring. Um, I think we're aiming for a March release, so stay tuned for that. It's Beneath Sheep's Clothing movie. I've actually got a book that I think will be very helpful. I didn't write it, so it's readable. Um, <laughs> I, co I co-wrote it. I helped a guy. He presented me a manuscript. I fleshed it out. Uh, he made sure it was in the same voice that he had originally written it, which is very easy to read, very accessible, very digestible. And um, that's coming out on Leap Day, so on February 29th. And that book is called The Queering of the American Child. And it talks about bringing queer theory into the schools. So what is queer theory? What is critical education? And how do they come together to indoctrinate our children into a cult that's based off of sex and sexuality, which is obviously wholly inappropriate? How has it infiltrated the um, major institutions like the U.S. Department of Education, the offices of civil rights, and so on? Uh, and so I think it's, um, I think people, I've sent it to a number of people to read early you know, advanced reading copies and people are absolutely taken by it. And I feel like since I didn't mostly didn't write it, I can talk about the book that way, but it's called the queering of the American child. And I think people will want to check it out and it's, you can pre-order it now, but it, it, it launches on uh, leap day. So the 29th of February, we figured that that's fitting because it's a queer date and it's about <laughs> queer theory. It's currently number one in gay studies on Amazon, which is hilarious. Look at that. Uh, Look at you participating in an op. Well, yeah, we might have selected that category on purpose <laughs> to see what would happen. And then look at look at how funny it is. Um, but yeah, so those are the kind of the two big things on the horizon. We've got that film coming, and I think it's going to be... I mean, I'm in other films too. I should plug for Eric. I, I'm in Letter to the American Church by Eric Metaxas, which is coming out you know, imminently. I, I told them I would mention to people that I'm in it. Um, as as you you know just very eloquently articulated, many of the people that claim to be hardcore Christian nationalists say that I say what I say because I hate Christians. Well, I'm in letter to a Christian church yeah. for, by Eric Metaxas. I just had a conversation with Eric about it, you know, on on the air again the other day, like two or three days ago. And I encourage people to go check that out as well. Um, I think I'm in like 11 documentaries. I can't remember what they're all called coming out in the next little while. But those are the three big ones to pay attention to. Letter to the Christian Church uh, from Eric Metaxas and the, the people associated with Turning Point that helped produce the film. And then Beneath Sheep's Clothing. And then uh, the book is The Queering of the American Child. Those are the things coming up on the horizon. I'm in the middle of writing another book about how woke is Mao. Uh, so I'm eyeballs deep in Mao research, hence reading a Mao thing in the middle of our conversation. Yeah. So I don't know when that's coming. Um, if I told you that it was going to be like this summer, which is what I want, that's a lie. It just won't happen. But hopefully I can get that out before the election. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I've actually heard some of your stuff on Mao, and it's uh, fantastic that you've done on new discourses. So, so yeah, I highly encourage people to check that out. I'll put all the links for any of that stuff down in the uh, description of the podcast here. James, thank you so much for being on again. Fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed it. Yep. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and go with God. Our thanks again to our guests for being on the show today. Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman was brought to you by our sponsors. If you like what you heard today, please do us a big favor and give it a five-star review and like it and share it with friends. And if you want to hear more awesome guests, make sure to check out past episodes. IndieThinker is a nonprofit paid for by our sponsors and the generous gifts of people like you. In order to hear more great guests like you did today, please consider giving a tax-deductible gift by going to IndieThinker.org. And just remember, your voice matters, but infinitely more when you think for yourself.